Check out this show and other great shows live on your iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry at www.mobileradio.me. Is there a war coming in the Middle East? Are we headed towards a one-world government, a one-world religious system? Will America be attacked again? Do ancient prophetic texts warn of a time we are living in? Are we in the last days, the time of Jacob's trouble, the end of the world as we know it? And what are the increase of UFO sightings? While we may disagree as to what is causing the phenomena, we can't agree that it is real, bursting, and not going away. Is this the coming great deception that ancient prophecy warns us about? Does time seem to be accelerating? Join me, your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli, as we explore these and other riveting, stimulating topics. This is Acceleration Radio. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Great to be here tonight. Can't wait for our guest to come on, David Weverly, talking about the Black Eyed Kids. Folks, I read the book, and I got to tell you, um, I've read a lot of stuff and been researching the, this phenomena for literally decades. And this book is... Uh, some pretty intense stuff there, some pretty intense interviews, and I think anyone who's interested in this uh, topic will find it well-written, well-crafted, and he really presents a lot of different solutions or answers to the enigma of the black-eyed children, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. Folks, I got to tell you, and I, it's a, I, you know, we've been, I've been on the road, and, and I'm um, going on the road again tomorrow. I'll be with Russ Dizdar. Um, and if you want to check that out, I'll be in Chicago, the Chicago Conference with Russ Dizdar. It's www.chicagosummit.net, www.chicagosummit.net. I believe it is sold out. I believe it's sold out. There may be a few seats left, uh, but if you want to get in there, you know, there's always spillover room. We can get you in, I think. But from I talked to Russ, was on his show last night talking about what we'll be discussing at the Chicago conference. Um, and I just, you know, it's going to be great folks. Lots of information. Uh, I will be giving a middle East update tomorrow evening, Friday evening at the Chicago summit.net conference. So if you're, if you're uh, <laughs> bidee, bidee, that's all folks, actually we're just beginning. Uh, so if you're in the area, try to come out to that because what is happening in the middle East folks is just, Unbelievable. There's just no doubt about it. Absolutely unbelievable. I will say this again, and I'm going to probably say it um, every show because I think it's imperative that we um, get this message across. I was in Maryland a short while back, two conferences ago, and while there, I received a word. It was during a worship service. I was uh, in the audience, just in the front row, minding my own P's and Q's, sitting in the front row. I was not standing. I had been standing and worshiping for some time. I was now in a sitting position, eyes closed, just reflecting, feeling the peace of the Lord. And this is the word I got. And I'm going to repeat it again because I think it needs to go out. And I say this not for any type of uh, sensationalism or any type of that kind of nonsense, folks. I'm just telling you what I got because I think it's imperative. And in view of what is happening in the world today, I think it, it speaks volumes. The word I received was this. Be still. And know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Look, behold, the days are coming when I will show my strength on the mountains of Israel. Let's walk through that first part. Be still and know that I am God. So many of us today, myself included, can get so caught up in what we do in the daily routine, the going through the motions of life. Every morning, my wife and I wake up. The first thing we do before we look at anything, we get into the Word, we read the Word, and then after that, after we're centered, after we've, we've read the Word and we've prayed, then and only then do we, I begin to start looking at news stories and, and thinking about the blog and, and posting these things. 
We need to learn to be still, to sit before him. And folks, you can do that on a stoplight. You know, you can do it for 30 seconds at a stoplight, just clear and just center ourselves and just go before the Lord. We can do it in between shots at a golf range. If, if we're, you know, in the golf, whatever, and I am, you know, as we're waiting for somebody else to putt, we can be praying, literally, just kind of going back, checking in, so to speak, you know, in between phone calls. I mean, there's all sorts of ways to continue to focus on him. Be still and know that I am God. Then he says, behold, look. The days are coming when I will show my strength on the mountains of Israel. I was asked, well, is that in the Bible? No, because it's a word. But guess what? It jibes with what is in the guidebook of the supernatural. Read Ezekiel 39. And that's exactly what he's talking about. I believe the days are coming. Here's why. A couple of days ago, I posted a blog. Um on my, my blog site, that's that's uh, www.lamarzuli.wordpress.com. The title of the post was WW3, World War III, Closing the Deal. There are um, links, U.S. and Russia deploy in Syria, Russia, China, Iran plane to stage in Syria, biggest Mideast maneuver. Why do they do that? They're war games. Why do they practice war games? Because they know war is coming. And this is the Daily Post. I combed the internet each morning looking for stories and keeping up with what is going on in the world. There was nothing on Fox News, CNN, USA Today, and the Huffington Post websites that indicated we are moving towards World War III. There were, however, stories about Octomom's porno shoot, Britney Spears informing us that being gay is fine, Hillary Duff regretting holding a friend's cigarette, and a mom who was addicted to plastic surgery. Not a peep about the blinks that I just mentioned a few seconds ago. Wake up, folks. Our media has a managed agenda, and that management is to keep us dumbed down and not informed. World War III is looming in front of us. We received intel from Israel yesterday that confirms some military action will be instigated between July and September. Israel is now surrounded by hostile countries. Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood won the elections, no surprise there. And as this video shows us, there will be war soon with Israel as the Brotherhood seeks to make its capital in Jerusalem. I predicted that this would happen over a year ago when the Arab Spring began in Egypt and the talking heads assured us that what would we see would be a democracy. If I were a Christian living in Egypt, I would flee immediately. Folks, if you have not seen this, um, this YouTube video, it is posted on my blog. The link is right there underneath that uh, um, World War III. It, it was actually posted on June 20th. Go check the link out. You've got to look at that, that link. But what it does show is a whole bunch of people in the tens of thousands chanting to Jerusalem we go, martyrs in the millions. Let me continue with the blog. Why doesn't our news media show this video? The answer is simple. Keep the public dumbed down and unaware of what is really going on. The Russians are bolstering their presence in Syria to assure that they will maintain their warm water port in Tartus. As I pointed out last week, is this the hook in the jaw that the prophet Ezekiel told us would happen in the latter days? Here is the prophetic word that I received while at a conference at Cornerstone Church in Maryland. I remind us of this because I believe it is both timely and a warning. Be still and know that I am God. Behold, the days are coming when I will show my strength on the mountains of Israel. War is coming in the region, and I believe it is World War III, and it will be a game changer. How will this affect the global economy? Now is the time to prepare by stockpiling resources. In closing today's post, I use the cover to my book, Politics, Prophecy, and the Supernatural, which might seem self-serving, to illustrate what was written in 2007 is happening in the world today. The book is more timely than ever as it discusses at length the Ezekiel prophecy. I believe we will see the coming together of these seemingly strange bedfellows, the title declares. Camp Pendleton is close to Oceanside, and yesterday my wife and I heard the thunder of bombs being dropped. War games. These are war games in preparation for the real thing, which in my opinion will happen soon. We are sending 12,000 troops to Kuwait in preparation for the coming war. The lines are drawn, and I wonder if a deal is about to be closed. Folks, all I can tell you, in my opinion, it's, um, it's happening. 
It's like right in front of our eyes. And isn't it interesting how the major, uh, the weasels in the stream media, the mainstream media, not one word about it. Not one word. You'll see it on my blog. I link all sorts of stories. So, I mean, that's basically it for that, folks. That's pretty much all I can tell you. But uh, I am just overwhelmed by what I see. By the way, um, I'm not sure what that was, all these weird sounds. Let me turn the volume of this down a little bit here. We live radio, got to love it. Um, last week when we did the show, we had about, oh, $2,500 towards the Cheats and Eats trip. Um, since then, we have been, we are now up to $8,100 for the Cheats and Eats trip. We had one donor, I won't mention her name, hi, Lisa, that uh, pledged $4,000. Uh, other monies came in. So we stand right now at $8,100. Our goal is $12,000. Again, I will not go to Cheats and Eats alone. There is absolutely no way I will do that. Um, when that money comes in, uh, at least you'll be able to get Russ Dizdar and Richard Grund um, on this 10-day trip to the Mayan pyramids. We still need another $4,000, perhaps a little more, to get Larry, who's an ex-Navy SEAL, which we would love to have go. That gives us a contingency uh, of people to move in sort of a, um, like the spies going into the promised land. Folks, there's going to be tens of thousands of people at this event. And, um, you know, I'm asked to speak there. I will, we will be, because now the three of us are going. We will be at Chichen Itza, at the Great Pyramid of Quetzalcoatl, December 21st, 2012. If something begins to manifest, <clears throat> Russ, Richard, and myself will literally take an offensive battle stance and try to close whatever is coming in. Let me take a sip of water. Want to donate? Want to be part of us? Um, this expedition, which is going at Chichen Itza, this is on the front lines, folks, and it's not something I do. Oh, boy, I get to go to the front lines. It's not where I'm at. It's like, in a way, going to Afghanistan. I mean, it's the same deal. Um, in some ways, much more intense. Um, the other side of the aisle has done the work. The Christian church, for the most part, sleeps. We will be having... Uh, People pray for us. I know my contingency of people will be praying for us. I know that Russ's people, Richard's people, uh, we will set up a prayer network. and We will be posting, providing we have Internet service, what is going on. But we need your prayers. Those of you who can contribute, we're still out about $4,000. Um, please consider contributing to the Chi Needs a Trip if you want to. There's a donation button on the right side of my blog, right underneath the blog roll, and also L.A. Marginally links. That's lamarzuli.wordpress.com. So I know that we're going. Um, it seems to be uh, sealed, and I, I would cover your prayers and also would ask um, that you uh, pray about contributing or also pray about coming. Um, you know, it costs four thousand dollars. You can you can sign up for the trip yourself under my name, and uh, off you go. Um, it's it's being held by Power Places Tour. The Yuk uh, in the Yucatan, 2012. Uh, it's a 10 day tour. We'll be will be leaving from Houston, flying directly to the Yucatan, and all that four thousand dollars includes all expenses, all airfare um, from Houston to the to the place. 10 days, all hotel accommodations, all meals. So you'll definitely want to check that out. And that, of course, is on the blog site. By the way, folks, Watchers Four is completely done. And that will be available probably sometime next week. We'll start shipping that out. Uh, you'll save five dollars if you order before I think it's next Thursday. Uh, once we get them, once we get them in our hands, then the, then it goes back up to the normal price. But uh, we actually showed that last night, and it was warmly received. I'm not sure whether our guest is on, producer Rick. If um, if David Weatherly is on, please give me the high sign here. Let me know. Not a high sign. That's a Masonic deal. Just let me know, will you? And uh, we'll go from there. Folks, uh, this fascinating book by David, by David Weatherly, The Black-Eyed Children, uh, will definitely keep you awake at night. There's a lot to think about here, and I think you'll find it fascinating. Uh, this book is a detailed study of the phenomenon known as BEKs, or Black-Eyed Kids. These strange beings are appearing around the world, knocking on doors, tapping on windows and cars, and <clears throat> demanding entrance. Are they demons, alien hybrids, or something else from a sinister corner of the paranormal? 
<clears throat> I've linked uh, David's website uh, on the blog. Again, that's uh, lamarzulli.wordpress.com. And uh, if he's there, Rick, please bring him on. And uh, David, if you are there, just, just say, hey, I'm here. We'll start the interview. David, okay, not yet. All right. Well, he will call in. In the meantime, plenty to talk about. And let me go back to um, in other news stories because that's what's what's happening. <clears throat> what we're seeing, folks, if you have not been following this, the Middle East is a total disaster. We see Egypt with the election of the Muslim Brotherhood, which, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, talked about that uh, when the uh, Arab Spring was just happening uh, last uh, year, a year ago, and I and I predicted, I said, well, what we'll see is we'll see Sharia law, and that's the next step. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has been elected. Uh, the Egyptian military are still desperately trying to cling to the rules, the reins of power. So far, they have not done that. They will more than likely not be able to, and we will see the Muslim Brotherhood reign supreme in Egypt. Already, arms are being funneled into across the Egyptian border to uh, Hezbollah, I'm sorry, to Hamas, which is in the Gaza Strip. Let's make it real clear. War is coming in the Middle East. When you've got an imam, and I talked about that, that stands up and whips the crowd into a frenzy and tells them, to Jerusalem we go, martyrs in the millions. Folks, that's what's going on here. World War III is looming. I cannot say it any clearer than that. And it is more than likely a game changer. More than likely a game changer. If you have not stockpiled food, may I highly and strongly recommend that you do so. Please, folks, it's it's coming. World War III is coming. Time to prepare. Um, I could go on, but I just was uh, informed by my wonderful producer, Rick, and all the front people here on Fringe Radio, that my guest, David Weatherly, is on. We will be having questions the last 10 minutes of the show, so 15 minutes of a show. If you have a question for David after, you know, while we're on, uh, shoot me an email at la at lamarzulli.net or, of course, you can call in when I tell you you can call in, but not quite yet, at 888-682-7688. That number again, 888-682-7688. Again, let's welcome David Weverly, the author of The Black-Eyed uh, Children, David, thanks for being here on Acceleration Radio. The pleasure is all mine, sir. Thanks for coming on. All right. Thanks a lot for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's jump right into it. David, why did you write this book? What got you interested uh, in the black-eyed children? And while you're giving me that answer, tell us what these black-eyed kids are. Tell us in your words what you think they are. Sure. Well, um the basics of these encounters are a pair of children. It's the most often occurrence, but they do appear by themselves, sometimes in threes or small groups. They are children that are showing up at people's doorsteps. Uh, they're showing up at cars and parking lots, hotel rooms. They're even showing up at, at boats. And they're trying to get themselves invited in. It really fits a lot of classic vampire demonic lure, they're trying to convince the person to ask them in by pretending that they need some kind of assistance. They need to use the telephone or they, they just need to come in for a few minutes because they're only kids. And what we find in these encounters is that people are experiencing something akin to attempted mind control, and that's something we hear very often from the, for lack of a better word, from the victims of these encounters. The kids appear with very pale skin. Sometimes it's uh, very pasty. It looks unnatural. I, I've never had a report where there's any kind of a blemish on the, on the skin. And these are kids that generally age and range from about 8 years old up to about 13. That's the most common age that we find in these encounters. Now, those are young teenagers, you know, they should have some kind of freckles or pimples or something. No, nothing. The eyes, of course, are the most obvious aspect of these encounters. They're completely black. We're not talking about just the people. The entire square, the entire eye is black. And these kids terrify people. The end result is usually that the, the victim experiences a level of, of fear or panic and they're able to break the encounter and run away from these kids. Wow. Well, simple to break basic your of what the kids are. 
David, let me let me take I'm a done. break because you're you're kind of distorted, and we're gonna take a little break, go to commercial break, and then we'll do the rest of the whole show without without break. And uh, when when um, I go to break, Rick, our producer, will try to see if he can work his magic. Anyway, let's see what happens, folks. You're listening to Acceleration Radio. I am your intrepid host, La Marzulli. Our guest tonight, David Weatherly. Um, about the black eyed children. Folks, keep it right here. We'll be right up right back on the other side of the break. You're listening to the finest podcasting right here on the Fringe Radio Network, featuring great programs like Acceleration Radio and the Bruce Collins Show. If you would like to host a live show on the network, please consult our rates page and contact the producer with questions. Tell your friends about the network, talk about us on social media, and leave feedback on iTunes. We appreciate you and strive to bring you the best content. Visit us at FringeRadioNetwork.com. Mr. Burns, is that a smile on your face? Why, yes, Smithers, it is, indeed. You see, I've just come back from the Bohemian Grove. Gosh, sir, I wish you would have invited me. The Grove is no place for a commoner. Of course, sir. What, if I may ask, was on the agenda this year? We must destroy the Bruce Collins Show with Bruce Collins and his meddling co-host, Chad Miles. How about if I release the hounds, sir? Excellent. Excellent. You're listening to the Fringe Radio Network right here at FringeRadioNetwork.com. If you would like to sponsor a program or advertise on our website, please contact us. Join the Fringe Radio Network on Facebook and subscribe to our programs on iTunes and tell your friends about us. We're so glad you've joined the Fringe. And now, back to the show. Shabbat host, L.A. Marzulli, folks. Great to be here. Our our guest tonight, David Weatherly, having a little bit of technical difficulties, but I think we've ironed them out. David, um, you know, all through the book, and this is what just blew me away, it's like you've interviewed people. Um, so you're that have actually experienced the black eyed kids, the black eyed children. Um, so you're like one step away. And I know I did the same thing with my alien interviews book. It's like you're as close as you can get to the experience without actually experiencing it yourself. And in some ways, that's a good thing. Tell us about um, some of these people that you interviewed. Um, and one of you know, and how the kids just show up and, and you know, come on, Mr. My, my, my favorite quote is right on the back of the book. Just let us in. This won't take long. Oh, my gosh. It just makes the hair in the back of my neck stand up. Tell us some of, your, tell us some of these stories, please. And, and that's why I put that on the book. I thought on one level it sounds very innocent. On another level, it's one of the creepiest things I've ever heard in my life. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you consider it in conjunction with these kids and what they're doing during these encounters as far as how they're making the people feel, it, it becomes very, very creepy. Uh, you know, I got involved with this phenomena because I heard about it originally in the late 90s. And at the time, it was interesting. I, now, I've been a paranormal investigator for well over 35 years and all aspects of the paranormal from uh, ufology to cryptozoology, sure. haunted sites, and so forth. And I had heard these stories. I thought they were interesting. But at the time, 
that was sort of the the period of the birth of the internet internet chat rooms and forums and so forth and i thought okay this is interesting but it could be an urban legend what really changed my mind was a gentleman i met whose story is is documented in the book early on his name was paul and this gentleman he's he's six three six four bodybuilder martial artist prison guard this is yeah. a guy who has seen the worst of the worst he's seen people shanked in prison brawls he's been in the middle of it all and he was a complete skeptic about anything paranormal but he couldn't leave the topic alone he always brought it up and i knew that he had some story that he just needed to get out and lo and behold it happened one day he asked if he could join me for lunch and this man just sort of opened up to me and he started telling me his story now his story was that he came home from work he walked in his house and went to the kitchen his wife and child were out of town he went in to make himself a sandwich or something, and he uh, he heard a knock, at a slow knock at the door. He hmm. couldn't figure out who's puzzled. Has anyone be why they weren't using the doorbell? And Ellie, you still there? I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm getting some weird static on this end. I, I got to jump in and tell you, you know, I, I interview about a lot of topics, and I never have technical problems unless I'm talking about these <laughs> kids. <laughs> okay, wow. so Paul uh, Paul walked in his kitchen. He started making a sandwich. He heard someone knocking at the door. He went and answered his door, and he found two kids standing on the doorstep. And they were wearing just very, what he described as drab clothing, uh, you know, grays and browns. They had their heads t slightly tilted down. And they said, hey, we just thought we'd stop by for a while. <laughs> and, you know, like anyone would react, Paul said, uh, I, I think you kids have the wrong house. And their res response was, we'll just come in anyway. Oh, now, as I said, this gentleman, he, he's not used to being in this kind of a situation. He's not used to feeling nervous, but for some reason he did. And on the surface, these were just a couple of kids, but he, he couldn't, he couldn't figure out what was going on here. He tried to, he tried to ask them questions. All they did was just redirect and, and basically keep repeating the same phrases over and over again. He finally, he decided, uh, you know, so, something wasn't quite right. These kids were too old to be friends of his kids. He knew everyone in town so, or in his neighborhood. So it, you know, it wasn't someone he recognized. And he decided to try to get a little bit better look at these kids, so he moved forward slightly. And when he did, one of them completely raised his head and looked directly at him. And that's when Paul realized these kids had solid black eyes. Wow. And his reaction was just uh, one of near panic. He, he went back in his house. He slammed the door on these kids and sort of held himself against the door for a moment. And then he walked across the room. His house has a very open floor plan. He, he got over to the living room, and he, he was so in a state of panic that he just couldn't figure out what was happening because it wasn't a feeling he was used to experiencing. Then he right. heard this noise, this, again, a long rapping, and he turned around, and one of these kids is looking in the little side pane uh, beside oh. the door. With those, and that, that's an image that'll just burn in your mind whether you've had the experience or not. You know, this little, little face with black eyes peering in the window at you. And uh, at that point, his, his fear gave way to uh, anger. And he rushed to his bedroom, grabbed his firearm, came back out. Now, this all took only a few seconds. He said the only thing he could think of in that moment was that he, he wanted to frighten those kids the way they had frightened him. He flung the front door open, and there was no one there. No one there. He searched. He searched his yard. He searched up and down the street, the neighborhood. He asked neighbors. No one had seen them. There was no sign of these kids. And, again, this is another typical aspect of these encounters. They seem to be able to uh, vanish suddenly. Right. So that sort of is a, a typical encounter. Now, there are a lot of, of variations, that, as you've seen in the book. There sure. are other aspects that uh, appear in some of these encounters but uh what is consistent is that they instill terror in people that even people like paul who just aren't used to having this kind of experience
Let me let me ask you. Let's pick a couple of these stories. One of the most chilling ones to me, um, and I, I obviously I remember Paul's story, but um, the woman who left her son, I think he was around eight or nine or ten in the back seat, just for a minute while she went to the store, and when she came back and she opened the door and looked in the rearview mirror, um, there's a black-eyed kid sitting next to her son. Tell us about that story. Right. That case is very unique in that, you know, I, I get reports all the time and I get questions all the time. What happens to people who let these kids in? That's a very difficult question to answer on one level because we simply don't have many reports. Now, there could be one of two reasons for that. You know, it could be that most of these people just aren't ha having encounters where they invite the kids in or who's to say that, you know, some of the disappearances and so forth that happen aren't a result of these kind of encounters. The woman whose story is documented in the book is the one story that I have published where this one of these children was invited in. And obviously, as you saw, it had very, very chilling consequences. Now, as you said, this woman pulled up at a convenience store. She it, it does this all the time. It's it's a area where she's comfortable leaving her kid in the car for a few moments. Uh, her son is 10 years old. She ran in the store, grabbed her, her milk and bread, and came back out. And on autopilot, jumped in the, the SUV and reached to turn the key over and looking in the rearview rear mirror as she did so, and there's a pair of black eyes staring back at her. This wow. kid was sitting in the middle, middle of the seat next to her son, who was directly behind her. She felt immediate fear. She jumped out of her SUV. She opened the back door and snatched her son out and ran back in the convenience store. And uh, what ensued is a, a fairly uh, strange set of circumstances. She ran in the store, and, of course, the clerk was concerned that, you know, there was a robbery or a carjacking or something going on. She didn't really tell him what was happening because she was just too shaken up by it. Uh, he went outside promptly and couldn't find anyone. He just found the SUV with the doors standing open. And uh, she was too shaken up to even get back in her own vehicle, so she called her husband, who promptly came down. She wouldn't explain the situation to him uh, either. What she did do was uh, they switched cars. So the husband took her SUV, went to drive home, a few miles away was in an accident and totaled the SUV. He ended up in the hospital. The, the doctors kept him for observation because they felt like he had a concussion. Uh, fortunately, he was okay. Now, as all of this was unfolding, this woman was having a conversation with her, her son to try to determine exactly what had happened. And she asked him the questions that any mother would ask. Uh, do you know that boy from school? Oh, no, Mommy. Uh, I, I don't know him. Uh, well, why, why did he get in our car? Well, he, he didn't get in. He, he said that I had to invite him. So, you know, here we have a case where a, a child, a 10-year-old child, completely innocent, invites one of these beings in, not knowing any better. And this boy, you know, he just saw another child. He saw a potential playmate. And he, he even told his mother that. He said, well, I, I thought we could go to my house and play. He said he wanted to come to my house. The result of this encounter, however, was that this young boy, this 10-year-old boy, became very ill. Hmm. His mother had to take him to the doctor's. The, he, he went to multiple doctors. Frankly, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him because wow. his symptoms kept changing. And this is one of the most bizarre things about it. At first, they thought he had the flu. They thought he had some kind of a stomach virus. Then they thought he had appendicitis. Well, then he broke out in what appeared to be measles. And they thought that's perhaps what was wrong with him. So... Every time they thought they could figure out what was wrong with this child, his, his symptoms would shift and change to uh, appear as though they were, it was something else. So the result was the doctors really didn't know how to treat him and what treatment they did offer didn't make any difference at all. This boy was sick for uh, quite a period of time, and the mother especially firmly believes that the only way the boy was saved was through prayer. Wow from her family and from friends 
and sort of a constant uh, visual over this uh, young boy. The mother's oh. absolutely convinced that what, what they encountered was something that was just pure evil. Right. Let, let me ask you something, uh, David, here. Um, <clears throat> was there, did the boy have physical contact with this black-eyed kid, or don't you know? Yes, he did. Uh, that was something that it took. In fact, I don't think that's in the book because it took it's quite not, some right. time to get those details out, only because... Um, you know, I, I talk with these people, I meet them if possible, I interview them multiple, multiple times, and there's a very long list of questions. The The mother was very nervous about broaching the subject anymore with her son, so it, it took some time to get some answers from him. But obviously this boy was sitting in the middle of the, the seat, and, it, and so I had her ask a simple question, you know, as to how this boy got in. Did, did he climb over? And indeed, that is what occurred. So there was physical contact. Let me ask you something, David. To the best of your knowledge, did this being, did this entity give the boy something, anything at all? As far as a physical object, no. Yes. He, no, he did, he did not give him anything. Okay. You also mentioned in this story that when they switched cars and the father was driving the SUV down the road, he was overcome by some sort of a strange smell in the car. Tell us about that. That's correct. That's something that shows up in some of these cases. People describe it as the most foul odor they've ever encountered. There are a number of cases where people encounter the kids and and they are emitting this odor. Uh, sometimes it seems to manifest after the kids have left. And it's Every person will describe it slightly different, but consistently they say it's the worst thing they've ever smelled in their lives. Oh, boy. Let now me that, ask you, you know, that again, sure. Uh, well, no, finish your thought with, you know, that again regarding the smell. Well, well, that again with, the, you know, these encounters, the bizarre thing about these beings is that they share things in common with a wide range of paranormal phenomena. I mean, that this foul's odor that's really traditional vampire lore. You know, people are, are focused now on, on these sparkly, ridiculous vampires from Twilight. But you go back to early vampire lore, no, they're creatures that are undead. They've crawled out of the grave, and, they, and they're and they foul, and they right. they reek of, of, you know, decay. So also that's with, what and, we're seeing and, in some of these experiences. Yeah, also in, 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 in ufology, we get the same thing. Sometimes people, when these entities appear, specifically the reptilians or others, entities appear, the, the, the smell is overwhelming. Um, you, you mentioned something, and I want to touch on, on this briefly, that uh, the mother was convinced because of prayer. What was her religious paradigm, or didn't she divulge that to you? She did. Uh, she was. Uh, I, I'll just leave it at she was Christian. I'm, I'm sorry. What was that, David? I, I'll just. Uh, what I'll state here is that she uh, she practices a Christian a Christian okay. tradition. All right. Did anyone? Um, and I'll, I'll drop it now because I want to move on to something. Let me just ask one more question about this kid regarding the prayer. Did um, you said a lot of prayer went out to this kid? Was the kid taken to a pastor or a priest, and any type of you know deliverance done over him, or don't you know? There wasn't a, what you would consider a traditional deliverance done over him. No, uh, but there were uh, there were clergy present that did that did come and uh, say prayers over him. Okay. And then, then the kid was healed and it baffled the doctors and the kid was healed. Let me ask you something. We've got questions That's lining up in the queue and we were, you know, we're running down in like 20 minutes. Maybe we should go to two hours. I don't know. But we, we're going to have to have you back on, David. It's just there's so much to talk about. Um, what I loved about your book is that you, you just kind of opened it up and went, well, you know, what are these kids? And you had like the idea that maybe they're demonic. Maybe they're hybrids of something. Um, maybe they're, you know, from some other time, let's say in the future. Run through some of those um, possibilities of what these, what these entities are, in your opinion. Sure, there's, there's a wide range of possibilities. Uh, of course, we've already addressed the demonic or the, the undead possibility. They also share a lot of things in common with alien hybrids. 
And that's something that a lot of people are absolutely convinced that these beings are alien hive children. And I'm talking about, the, of course, the gray aliens. And, you know, if you look at the image, that alone, it, there's some stunning comparisons because the, the grays, of course, have the large, solid black eyes and the small stature. And, you know, there's often uh, a, a very uh, strange texture to their skin in abduction. Right. Phenomena. So, obviously, some similarities there. However, <clears throat> there's another. Uh, guys, there, there's several other things. For instance, they share things in common with what you would consider a trickster archetype. You know, they seem to show up in, in and do some very bizarre things. Uh, there are similarities with what's called a tulpa, which is also, a, in Western terms, a thought form. In other words, a being that is created from pure mental energy or thought. Right. Um, there are uh, similarities. A lot of people believe these things are a manifestation of the jinn. And, of course, in the modern world, we call those genie, but uh, they've really become very uh, comical in the Western world. The traditional genie is, is called a jinn in the Middle East, and it actually is has some very sinister aspects. And some commonalities with the trickster, but uh, much more devious they even share things in common with men in black encounters, which of course are associated with UFO phenomena. But again, you know, there's some uh, stunning similarities. The electronic interference seems to be common around these black eyed children. And that's a classic men in black thing. The use of repeated phrases and, and monotone way of speaking. Again, that's classic men in black lore. So, it's a fascinating puzzle. It really is. And, and it's very strange how many lines these beings cross in, in these encounters in terms of, of the similarity with other phenomena. Let me ask you something. And, and I mean, I, I lean towards, and we've talked about this off the air when we had our wonderful phone conversation a while back, but um, you know, I think we're looking at uh, hybrids and I, I agree with your um, you know, premise that these are the hybrids of the, what so-called greys or whatever. Um, I've got a totally different, you know, take on that perhaps than most people. But um, let me ask you this: what, what, do, what do you, where do you lean, or are you just completely open and, um, you know, sort of on the back burner, still waiting for more evidence, or do you, are you leaning towards a particular, um, you know, paradigm or, or what? In terms of these beings themselves. Uh, you know, the book itself, as you stated, I, I leave it very open. I present all the evidence and all the comparisons and let people make their own judgment. My personal belief is that these are some kind of interdimensional beings. Now, to me, you know, I have a different approach to a lot of these things, and that, that crosses some of the lines. I mean, they may be some kind of hybrid being. There's a right. lot of evidence for that. But uh, I don't believe that they're extraterrestrial. However, that doesn't mean they're not from some other level of existence. There's just too right. many strange things to me that really stand out. You know, the way these kids come and go, it's almost as if they're, they're shifting out of our reality or out of our, our level of awareness. And, you know, this, a lot of it just points to some kind of an interdimensional being to me. Now, I will say this because I'm always asked, are there positive aspects to these encounters? And no, I do not believe they are. I believe these beings have a very sinister purpose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the people who are lean more towards the, the alien hybrid possibility think that, oh, it's okay, they're just innocent kids. No, I don't think so. I, I don't think innocent kids are coming along and generating this level of fear from people and causing the types of things that these beings are causing. Yeah, there's something so repulsive and so uh, inherent in any of the viewers from according to your book and the research, you know, that you've done, which, by the way, is absolutely stellar, um, you know, the black-eyed kids, black-eyed children, um, you know, look, we've all been in many, many situations, and when when that fear, you know, fight-or-flee instinct comes up, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a real flare going off inside the human psyche, um, and everybody reacts the same way. Well, I, you know, the people that I've talked to with the greys, it's the same thing. The greys show up, the, the fear level is absolutely through the roof. I mean, through the roof. So, like right. you, I lean towards 
Um, it's sinister, whatever it is. You know, there's nothing good that can come out of it. Let me take some questions here because we're coming down to the, believe it or not, the home stretch. Fascinating. David, we're going to have to have you back on this summer. But it's just too much to talk about. Um, do actual, this is from Murph, uh, Murphy Monkey. Murph, thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Uh, the question to you, David, is this. Do actual photos exist of the Black Eyed Children? Is there anything that you've been able to put your finger on? I get that question a lot, too. Now, here's there, there are two answers. One is, quite honestly, it wouldn't make any difference. Photos are so easy to digitally manipulate that, frankly, no one would buy it. Now, what is compelling about this is that in the cases that I find valid where there are security cameras present, wow. with, without fail, those security cameras experience some kind of a malfunction. They... They turn off, they stop working, they lose a span of time when the encounter occurred. As I said earlier, strange electronic things happen around these kids. And, of course, that fits right into what we know about um, the electronic interference with uh, people who sight or see UFOs. I mean, we get that all the time. That's been going on for, for decades. Let's take another question, David. Um, this is from Ben in Johnson City, Tennessee. Ben, thanks for listening to the show. Appreciate it. Uh, ben writes, hello, L.A. and David. Have any encounters with these black-eyed kids ever been stopped by a Christian who rebuked them in the Lord's name? Anything on that? You know, here's something that's interesting on the religious aspect. A large portion of the people who encounter these beings are not actively practicing any kind of uh, religious tradition okay. until after the encounter. <laughs> so, you know, while there are people, yeah, <laughs> while there are people who uh, do consider themselves religious or, or spiritual during the encounter, they certainly delve much more into it after they, they encounter these kids. So, you know, I've, I've never had an encounter interesting enough, for instance, from a priest or a minister. I, I would love to, to find out if there has been something like that. Uh, yeah, in yeah. fact, most of the encounters, a large portion of these encounters, however, do occur to people in positions of authority. So a lot of law enforcement, military, uh, government employees, uh, that is, that's one of the few common threads with these, with these victims. Well, let me take another question. This is from Warren in South Carolina. It kind of dovetails into the last question that we had. Um, uh, Warren writes, and thanks, Warren, for listening to your show. Appreciate it. Have a black-eyed kids been reported to have approached a, a faith-filled Christian, like, like you just said, a minister? So you've kind of already answered that. But listen to this. If so, what was the result? But we're not sure. Here's the second part of the question. Uh, Warren read earlier about a Rottweiler dog that turned tail and ran when he encountered a black-eyed kid. So have you ever heard anything about that, David? Well, first of all, Warren, thanks for reading my blog, because I just posted that, I think, last week. <laughs> wow. That's a really interesting story that came in. There, there have been very few of these encounters where there has been an animal present. And this particular huh. encounter was, was very revealing on a number of levels. Now, I'll, I'll buzz through it really quickly. This is a gentleman in uh, Texas who came home from the grocery store, approached his front door, and he has a pretty open yard. There's just nothing, not any trees or bushes or anything. He reaches up, he opens the front door, and just as he does, he realizes there's a kid standing on the grass down beside his steps. Wow. And this kid looks at him, and, and get this, L.A., this kid says, is it food time? Oh, my gosh. And oh my gosh. this guy, you know, the, the door has swung the rest of the way open. This this guy is is puzzling. I mean, he, you know, he asked me, he says, who the heck says something like that? Yeah, and nobody. That's the clean version of what he, he, he related to me. <laughs> he, uh, you know, he, he stood there for a moment and this kid is saying, it it's food time. You should ask me in. Now, as this wow. is unfolding. This gentleman has a three-year-old Rottweiler that he raised from a puppy. He has witnessed this dog face down a rattlesnake. And 
as he's standing at the door, he has solid wood floors all throughout his house. He hears his dog barking in the back of the house, and he hears it running. It turns the corner, and he sees it running down the hall towards his front door. As it gets towards the front door, all of a sudden, this dog tries to put the brakes on him. And on a polished wood floor, I'm sure somebody <laughs> is, you know, some of you have probably seen that happen before. Sure. This dog practically falls over himself out onto the, the steps and turns around as fast as he possibly can with his tail between his legs and his head down, whining and running as fast as he can back in the house. He went and hid under the bed. Wow. Uh, this time, of course, he ended up ducking in the house and closing the door and, you know, looking outside when he got his nerve up, and, and there was no sign of this kid anywhere, of course. But his, his dog stayed under the bed for the longest time. He literally had to reach under and drag his dog out from under the bed, but the dog wouldn't stay out. He, he went back under the bed, bed and hid again. So, wow. you know, this is very appealing to me because obviously animals have a very different level of sensitivity, and this dog sensed this before he was even in, in sight. Uh, and sight line of this kid. So whatever these beings are, they're projecting some kind of an energy that obviously animals are sensitive to on a different level than we are. You know, I would I would add to your sinister word. I would I would I would uh, add one word: wickedness. I would add wicked. Yeah. Um, just just from you know from what everybody's saying. Let's take another. Wow, this is strange stuff. Um, hi, Ella. This is from uh, Richard. Richard, thank you for um, listening to uh, Acceleration Radio and. Uh, it's probably a question. Hi, Ale. Curious to know if there are any commonalities among those who are victimized by these children. Are they, for example, predominantly of any particular religious persuasion, or um, you know, is there any any link at all that you've been able to find, David, between the victims? question, Richard? There are very few these victims. They are of varied races varied spiritual traditions. Uh, there really aren't any common themes or very few commonalities among the victims. Uh, there's, you know, wide uh, range of ages of people who encounter them. Um, geographically, there's not any restrictions. And when I first started looking at, at the phenomena, it appeared to be exclusive to North America. But over time and during my research, of course, I, I found encounters from all virtually all over the world i have accounts as widespread as australia south africa canada england and they're they're all over the world at this point now the phenomena is growing too and over oh. the last few years there seem to be more and more of these encounters occurring david do you think that they're children or do you think that there's something else I don't. I don't think they're actual children. No. Okay, I don't either. Here's another question from uh, Max Neptune, a longtime listener and good friend. Max, thanks for listening to the show. Appreciate it. Max asked, "Are these kids concentrated to any particular region or regions? Are the police notified? If so, do these agencies that have investigated have reports and dispositions?" Great question. Well, I answered part of that. They're not restricted. Right. Uh, they are they are indeed all over the country and in fact all over the world at this point. Uh, curious enough, there have been a number of, of law enforcement officials that have had encounters with these kids. There really aren't official reports filed for a number of reasons. One is that the people are simply too terrified and they're honestly just unsure of what they've encountered. And really when it comes down to it, you know, what are you going to report? Uh, two kids knocked on my door, and they scared the heck out of me. Well, <laughs> thanks for calling, man. Please don't call anymore. There's, you know, these kids never intrude. They never force their way in. Mm. So, you know, on the surface, they're not committing any crime in, in a legal sense. So the answer, the answer is no, there really aren't reports. Now, the, the law enforcement officers who have encountered them have done the, their best to try to, uh, you know, take a rational approach and, and investigate the area and, and canvas the neighborhood and find out if these kids actually live there, if they're, you know, real kids that are in some kind of trouble or something's happening, but it, it never turns anything up. 
Wow, that's just amazing. You know, David, that's basically all the time we have for tonight. We're at the bottom of the hour. Tell us how we can get your book, please. Sure. The book is available at leprechaunpress.com. If you order copies from there, they do come signed, if that makes any difference to folks. It's also available on Amazon.com. And you can follow my further work on all areas of the paranormal at twocrowsparanormal.blogspot.com. That's two crows, like the bird. And uh, you spell that out, T-W-O. David, let me ask you something. I'm, I don't want to put you on the spot here. But, um, you know, we barely scratched the surface of this thing. I'd love to have you come back on next week. Would you be available next Thursday to do another show with us? Uh, you know what? Let me check my schedule, but I'd love to be back on with you, Elaine. I think it would be great because, you know, we had a, a string of questions and some people are going, this, this can't be it. You've got to have them back on. If, if we, you know, we need to know more about it. Let <laughs> me know. Shoot me an email. Um, folks, that's about all the time we have for tonight. David Weberly, the author of The Black Eyed Children. And, and folks, I, I have read the book. It is just a wonderful wonderful uh book well researched well written uh i gave it uh five stars it's just you know if you're interested in this kind of stuff it's it's the book for you it's very disturbing though because it, it deals with you know a very sinister what i believe would be wicked would be another uh word that you could use to describe the phenomena um folks uh, we know that by putting on the armor of god and um and David, you know, just just for what it's worth, when you say the blood of Jesus, it might sound like it's, you know, we're talking religion, but we're really not. And it's, uh, I mean, that's that stuff is just creepy beyond all creepy stuff, folks. By the way, um, we are giving a Watchers giveaway. If you uh, go to my website, the link is there. Take your right to it. We're giving all three Watchers series away, so it's a raffle contest. Go in, sign up, and we'll you know announce the winner on the air. Folks, that's all the time we have uh, for tonight. Our guest has been David Weberly, the Black Eyed Children. I'll be in Chicago, leaving there for tomorrow. Uh, I will be there with Russ Dizdar at the Chicago Summit.net. If you're interested in checking that out, there are some seats still available. Uh, Russ told me it's sold out, but they can squeeze maybe another dozen or two in there. That's about it. www.chicagosummit.net. That is all the time we have for tonight. You've been listening to Acceleration Radio. Hats off to my good friend and producer, Rick uh, Hendrick, for all that he does to keep the show going. It will be posted on the blog, also on iTunes and, and YouTube shortly. That's how amazing Rick is. That's why we're here, folks. Tell a friend about Acceleration Radio. We'll see you here again next Thursday, same time. And remember, folks, I'll see you either on the air or in the air. Good night, everybody. Thank you.